Hi guys, and welcome back to another video on the world's only crowdfunded manned spaceflight program. Today we'll be talking about test stand for the BBM-100 engine. So you're probably thinking we talked about that two weeks ago, but uh, we have a few updates. So uh, let's just dive right in. Now, I would like to stress again that this is a uh, conceptual design. So this uh, might not necessarily be what, uh, what you'll see in the end, but, uh, but for now, it's a pretty good guess. So you will see that we got, uh, this time around, we got a single four, uh, 20 foot container. Last time I made a 40 foot container. So now it's 20 feet. And uh, that's because I think we can actually squeeze it in into a 20 footer. And then um, you will also notice from last time that there's a lot more uh, piping work this time around. So it's uh, it's a lot more complete, the model, uh, although there's still uh, some stuff missing. But let's uh, let's just hide the container for convenience and let's look at, uh, at the bits and pieces. So we of course got the uh, engine down here. So that is our BPM 100 engine. And I actually, I noticed on YouTube that there were some comments about that the engine was, uh, was designed wrong. And that's probably because, so it has some, some unusual proportions, this engine. And that's because it's actually a, a low pressure engine. So the, that means the, the proportions between the, uh, the diameter of the chamber and the diameter of the nozzle, they're a bit unusual. That's because it's a low pressure engine. So if you compare it to a, a Merlin, a SpaceX Merlin engine that runs at, uh, I suppose, 70 bars, whereas our engine runs at only 15 bars. And uh, that also means that our engine will have a lot less uh, performance. So we're estimating it will have an uh, ISP, specific impulse, of about 200 seconds. So for, uh, for a professional rocket engine, that's very low. But our rocket engine is not a professional professional rocket engine. It's made on a shoestring budget by a crowdfunded project. And actually, we don't need it to be very high performance. So we're not going to, uh, to orbit. We're just going to suborbital space. So we're traveling 100 kilometers up and 100 kilometers down again. And if you look at the energy requirements for that, it's, it's far less than going orbital. When you go orbital, the uh, the, the most amount of energy is actually the kinetic energy that is required to gain the to seven to nine kilometers per second of velocity that you need. We don't need that velocity. We just need to go 100 kilometers up. So we can uh, get by with a lot less performance and less performance means cheaper engine. So um, that's sort of the, uh, the short story on why our engine looks or appears to have a uh, a funny shape, an unusual shape. So we got the engine down here and it of course has the main propellant line. So we got the uh, LOX line here. We got some uh, valve here leading over to a LOX tank in the back of the test stand. And likewise on the other side, we got the fuel pipe that will connect through a, uh, a pipe uh, valve to a fuel tank. Now, this was also in place last time. And so now things start getting a little bit more tricky because you can see there's a lot of pipe works and there's some other sections around here. And so most notably, we have this section up here. So this is a uh, burner and then we have two heat exchangers. So this burner runs, it's a small rocket engine on itself. The exhaust is, uh, whoops, it is uh, down here. And so the exhaust from this rocket engine or burner it goes through the heat exchangers and then it ends up out here. Now the burner runs on, uh, it runs on liquid oxygen here and then it runs on ethanol here. So you can see this ethanol that runs on a burner, it comes from a small extra ethanol tank. So we don't run it to, to we don't want it to run on the same ethanol as the main engine. And that's because we want it to run on uh, ethanol with a different water content to keep this burner running very cool. Now this burner is not cooled in any way. The main engine is of course regeneratively cooled. So all the fuel will enter down here, run up the jacket and uh, cool the engine. The burner doesn't have any cooling system. So it needs to run cooler. And we uh, obtain that by running it fuel rich, massively fuel rich actually. 
it will run with an OF ratio of 0 0.55. So that's horrendously low from a performance perspective. But that means the uh, it will not get hotter than 800, 900 degrees. And uh, also by putting extra water in this ethanol that it runs on, we can keep the, the, uh, the temperature down quite a lot. Now, so what does this one evaporate? Or what does do we run through the heat exchangers? So you can see there's uh, some, so this is actually the outlet pipes. Um, so the inlet comes from this little guy. So that's a liquid nitrogen tank. And that liquid nitrogen is then pressurized by helium, gaseous helium. So the liquid nitrogen will run through here. It will run up, be distributed through these two valves so we can dose it. And um, the liquid nitrogen gets heated in the heat exchangers and the gaseous nitrogen will then, so inside here, there's a lot of loops of, uh, of pipes and the uh, heated nitrogen, so gaseous nitrogen will come out of these two tubes, which each goes to a main propellant tank. So the main propellant tanks are pressurized with nitrogen from this burner. So you can see there's a bit of pipe work going on to, uh, to be able to do that. But you can see down in the back, we also have a, a bunch of nitrogen bottles. So the burner obviously needs to, uh, to start before the main engine. So to pressurize the LOX tank before ignition of the main engine, we need to, to pre-pressurize it. So, uh, so that needs to be pressurized by these nitrogen bottles. So you can see there's a loop going up here to the main LOX tank. Now, so when the main LOX tank is pressurized, it will have pressure to start up the burner, which will then supply new nitrogen to pressurize both, both the fuel tank and the liquid oxygen tank. So I know it might be a little bit um, confusing and it's definitely something we haven't done before, but um, we think we can uh, we can pull it off and manage this. And uh, so it, it's relatively simple. Uh, it's just managing some uh, some pressures. And, um, and most notably for this system to work, we have to, uh, to measure the throughput of nitrogen, of liquid nitrogen through these two valves. So the burner will run at a constant or near constant uh, temperature. And, uh, and that it will do that by running at a constant uh, pressure. And so the dosing of nitrogen will be by these two valves. And that will actually be how we determine or we, we set the pressures of the two main propellant tanks. That will be by dosing uh, nitrogen through these two valves. So there will be some uh, PID controller measuring the pressure in these two tanks and dosing nitrogen through these two in response to keep the pressure in the two main propellant tanks up around 20 bar. So I hope this is uh, somewhat clear. Now on each of the uh, two propellant tanks, we of course have uh, some systems up on top. So we have uh, at least one pressure sensor. We have at least, whoops, we have at least one um, pressure relief valve. We have a uh, electronic valve such that we can relieve pressure automatically if we want to. And then we have a burst disc as a last backup. So if everything else fails, then there's a thin sheet of, uh, of metal foil in between these two flanges, which will just burst at some pre preset pressure uh, around 27 bars, which is before the tank will rupture. So that's the, uh, the final uh, measure of, of preventing the tank from bursting. Now, um, so you can see we have the main nitrogen bank up here, but there's also a smaller nitrogen bank up here. And you can see that has a lot of uh, wiring up and down here. So it has the, uh, the nitrogen supply from the uh, main nitrogen bank in the back. And then it has a, uh, three lines out. And so one line goes here to the main oxidizer line. So this is a perching mechanism. So uh, when we want to shut down the engine, we want to perch both the uh, LOX line here and we also want to perch the uh, fuel line, the ethanol line over here, with uh, simply just to perch it with nitrogen. And then the last uh, output from this one is uh, this line, which goes up and pressurizes the minor ethanol tank. So um, you can see there's a, a few updates to the, uh, to the test stand. I hope this was uh, sort of almost clear what is going on. Um, so the bulk 
information in this is of course that we have this unusual uh, heating system. So instead of having a turbo, we, uh, we rely on simply heating liquid nitrogen, feeding the gaseous nitrogen down through the uh, main propellant tanks and uh, pressurizing them in, uh, in that way. We will start building some of these components uh, very soon. And um, I think in a couple of weeks, we might run through the, uh, the fluid diagram with you guys. So this is of course based on a fluid diagram uh, of how the whole system is supposed to, to work. And I think we'll make a short video on, uh, on that and we'll look at tank sizes. We'll look at uh, all the requirements for, for some of the components. We'll look into what sort of valves we'll be using. And uh, so, you know, here at Copenhagen's Orbitals, we don't have money for uh, expensive uh, flight proven valves. Uh, we use uh, cheap hardware, then we modify it ourselves and we will uh, try and talk you through, uh, through some of that. And uh, I think that was it for this time. See you uh, next time. Copenhagen Suborbitals is a non-profit all-volunteer project. The reason we are getting so close to reaching space on our speaker rocket is because all of our crowdfunding supporters. If you've been following this project and feel passionate about new ways of exploring space and building rockets, you can help us out by going over to our website, www.compsub.com, and becoming a supporter with a small monthly or one-time donation that helps us pay workshop rent and buy materials. And in return, you get all these insider videos on building a space program which you don't really get anywhere else. So on behalf of everybody at Copenhagen Suborbitals, thank you for your support and we'll see you next time.